I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. I know you can't see me. I'm kind of the, the talking head here. I'm going to go this way so you can see our speakers today. Hola. <laughs> There's our expert presenters today. I'm actually Jay Lickus. I'm the marketing coordinator here at Benavia. And I want to welcome you to Care for the Caregiver, um, one of our monthly or bi-monthly educational workshops that we do. We've got them pretty much scheduled, scheduled all the way through till summer. So check out our website for details on that. But I'd like to introduce, I'm going to try to do it this way. Got me backwards. To my left is Mr. Presley Reader here. I'm pointing at him. And he's from Comfort Care Home Care. And then on this side, I have Mr. Sean <laughs> Dewey from Adult Care Assistance Home Care. And they are the presenters today. I'm going to let them do a little introduction about themselves, tell, them, uh, tell you a little bit about their backgrounds and the state of the industry right now. And then we have a presentation we will work through. We will stop periodically, obviously, for questions, but while we're into the presentation, uh, if I hear any background noise, I will mute to make sure that doesn't interfere with anybody on the call. And if you do have pressing questions while the presenters are speaking, we can do one of three things. You can raise your hand. We can see that. Or number two, there, if you look in the bottom right hand corner, there's a little button that says reaction. Are you all familiar with that? No. If you click on that, there's a little hand raising icon. You see it pop up. Oh, Marty, thank you. Thumbs up. There it I is. Love it. That's terrific. So you guys are way ahead of the general public as far as Zoom meetings are concerned. Or the chat box on the bottom, there's a little icon. It's kind of a conversation bubble. You can write your messages in the chat box. So um, I mean, we're here to support you. We are here to get to you all the information we can on your caregiving journey. And that's why we bring in experts like these two gentlemen to uh, bring all the, all the great stuff that you need to learn about today. And do not be bashful. This is an interactive workshop, so we want to hear from you as well. So I will turn it over. Who wants to start? Mr. Presley, why don't you introduce yourself? Can you hear us clearly? Everything sound good? Mm -hmm. Marty, you can't hear us. Okay. Sorry, Marty, you have a uh, sound issue. Gloria Jay, are you? Does everything sound good to you? Wonderful. Thank you. Marty, do you see a little, um, I'm going to ask you to unmute. So Marty, are, do you see your um, mute button, the little microphone button down there? If you click on the arrow to the right of that, and it'll say test speaker and microphone, you can test those and see if it'll work for you. <clears throat> okay, got to reinstall Zoom. I that's not good. <laughs> I think there was some glitch. With oh, your output is not working. Really so we can't it. hear you talk. Okay, so if you'd like, I mean, if you can hear us fine, we'll go ahead and uh, continue. And then if you have questions, just put them in the chat box, Marty. We'll watch for that, okay? Awesome. All right, gentlemen, Mr. Presley Reader. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll get through our introductions here pretty quickly so we can move into the presentation and give you plenty of time for Q&A today. It's a privilege to be with everybody. Happy New Year. My name, as Jay said, is Presley Reader. And uh, I'm not named after Elvis, but if you want to talk about that another time, we can. I can tell you the whole story. I have owned Comfort Care uh, in-home caregiving now for nine years, and we send caregivers into wherever you or your loved ones call home. That might be 
uh, an apartment in a senior living community that might be a residential home or elsewhere. And uh, they come in on a schedule and provide support for uh, daily activities. So it's uh, been an honor to work with Benavia. We work closely with them as the Sean and adult care assistants. And uh, it's great to be here today to talk to you a little bit about caregiver burnout and what your options are if you're experiencing caregiver burnout um, and how to care for yourself as a caregiver. So yeah. I'll let Sean do his intro and then we'll jump into the presentation. Perfect, yeah, that sounds good. My name is Sean with Adult Care Assistance Home Care and I am one of the partners over at Adult Care Assistance. And we've been here in the Sun City, Surprise, Peoria, Glendale area for a quarter century now. We've been working with seniors since 1996 and uh, incredibly proud of the partnership that we have had with Benavia for over 20 years and concur with what Presley was saying. You know, we are so lucky to have a community partner like Benavia who can help serve the seniors in this area and anything that we can do to give back and to help Benavia, help the seniors and help educate the community we're 100% in favor of. And so that's why we're here today is to help educate you guys and make sure that you're feeling comfortable with making some really challenging and difficult decisions. And uh, in terms of what we do, it's right on point with what Presley said. So we're a home care agency just as well as uh, Presley. And we come to wherever that client may need and help them based on the schedule and cares that they need. Awesome. Yeah. And so, so Sean and I work together in the same industry, providing that care. There's a need that's bigger than any one agency can meet. And so we're all partners with Benavia in doing that. Um, okay. We're going to jump into this presentation. I'm going to keep talking. I think Jay's going to try and pull it up on your screen, but I'll just keep going since we are uh, running a little bit behind here. You know, I'm going to talk in the first half about caregiver burnout. And you've probably heard that term before. And quite frankly, this is not a very uh, encouraging topic. There's just nothing good about caregiver burnout. It, it hurts the caregiver, it hurts the care recipient, and it hurts them both physically and mentally uh, in a variety of ways. And I'm gonna let you, you can kind of read, Jay, you can go to that next slide. Um, and as long as everybody's seeing the slides, I'm not gonna read through each slide, but you can read it and we'll be happy to send it to you afterwards so you can read through all of this. But um, I will say that the stress from caregiver burnout can cause increased uh, morbidity, mortality in caregivers and care recipients. Um, it also leads to inadequate levels of care uh, for the individual receiving the care and uh, a higher rate of institutionalization for the loved ones. So there are serious physical and mental effects that can result from caregiver burnout. Uh, it's a serious issue. And if you or a loved one are feeling it, you should really take, take steps to address it. On the next slide, a few statistics that you could run through there. Um, again, I won't read all of them, but family caregivers tend to experience weaker immune responses, which particularly right now, uh, we're all learning how important our immune systems are. Uh, more obesity, pain, and diabetes, and serious illnesses. And uh, down at the bottom is the one that <coughs> that I, excuse me, I see most commonly, and that is that 40 to 70 percent of caregivers have significant symptoms of depression. And uh, depression is the chronic condition I see most often when I meet with uh, hundreds of families that I've sat in living rooms with and talked to, they are experiencing depression because of the stresses that come with caregiving. So we have got to care for the caregiver as much as we care for the care recipient. That's the point. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, I did want to mention that when you're caring for someone with dementia versus other illnesses, uh, there is a consistently higher uh, burden uh, based on research for those who are providing care for uh, an individual with dementia. And part of that is because dementia tends to last longer, but I think even more so it's because the care recipient, 
become steadily less aware of what's going on with the caregiver. And so they're really not able to offer any support themselves to the care recipient. And families have such a hard time understanding the burdens of caring for somebody with dementia. I think families can understand that you have to help someone bathe or you have to help someone drive somewhere. But when you talk about dementia, it becomes hard for a family to realize the uh, extent of the caregiving required. So it really can have a bigger effect. I just wanted to touch on that. The next slide, again, uh, talking a little bit about depression, but also isolation and loneliness. You know, the studies show that, yes, it's hard to help somebody toilet. Yes, it's help, hard to help somebody bathe. Yes, when it goes on for a long time, it becomes harder and harder to be a caregiver. But most of all, caregivers become isolated and lonely, and that causes the physical and mental anguish. Uh, and so when we talk about some of the ways to intervene and prevent this, we're going to talk, we want to talk about how to make sure the caregiver does not get isolated and does not become lonely because that is a primary factor in the, the decline in their health and the health of the person they're caring for. So uh, you've got to address these. I can't tell you again how many families I've met with or talked to on the phone who say, I just need a little break. I just need to get out and see some friends. I just need to go to a movie or something along those lines. And certainly COVID has exacerbated that problem because caregivers were already isolated and lonely. It's become even more of an issue over the past year. So I uh, wanna talk about some warning signs on the next slide. Some of these are pretty extreme, but they're things to be aware of in yourself and in uh, your loved ones, including neighbors, friends, or anybody you're interacting with. Uh, one of the benefits of, of learning about this is that you can be a really good neighbor who identifies what uh, your neighbors are going through or other family members. Uh, you can see some of the questions here. Is, are there, is there a loss of interest in activities? Uh, are there, is there a withdrawal from friends and family? Uh, changes in sleep patterns, appetite, or weight? I think a lot of times people think, well, then maybe that's just my diet or a lack of exercise. They don't realize that the stress of caregiving can be leading to some of these responses like getting sick more often. Um, and then again, on a more extreme level, that last one, feelings of wanting to hurt themselves or the person that they are caring for. Now, I don't see that very common, but certainly that's a major warning sign. Um, the next, just moving right along here, I know you can jump in with questions, but rest assured, you'll be able to ask questions at the end too. So uh, don't worry if, if you can't, if you don't think of it right now. All right, so this slide says, uh, talks about, do you get help for the loved one, the care recipient, the caregiver? I think both, to be honest. Um, it gives you a couple of role plays here, approaches. These are written from the perspective of an adult child but you can use these for yourself. I've, uh, for example, on uh, the second approach, approach two, if the care recipient is not comfortable with finding alternative options like Sean's gonna talk about here in a minute, like respite care or um, just giving the caregiver a break like a respite or even moving other alternatives that we're going to discuss, then you can say, look, this I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for me. Uh, a lot of times the care recipient will be more responsive if they think that the additional help is being brought in for the caregiver um, because they don't want to be an extra burden. They don't want more care for them, but they don't realize 
that the caregiver is struggling so much. So you can say, this is not, not for you, this is for me and I need this. Uh, of course, that's a big hurdle sometimes. A lot of caregivers I talk to won't accept the help. They won't say that they need it when they really, really do. And it's totally understandable that they do because of uh, the incredible responsibilities of the job of caregivers. So just a couple of examples there of, of how you can talk about it. And I think what I like to emphasize on this slide is that you don't wanna wait to have these conversations until the burnout has already reached the level that I described earlier. You wanna get ahead of these conversations so that you don't have to go through the burnout and experience the mental, mental and physical pain associated with it. Try anticipate it as best you can that all caregivers experience some level of burnout and having these conversations about it before it becomes debilitating is really the critical point. You've got to try your best to get ahead of it. Um, okay, so some solutions on the next slide uh, that, that we can run through real quick. And, um, and then Sean's gonna talk about broader options that are available to you. But some of these solutions, uh, certainly confiding in trusted people, uh, including professionals, a lot of times people don't feel comfortable talking to me because they think I'm trying to sell them something. But there are a lot of services that have been created out there for you and your loved ones that are truly trying to be a value add to you. And certainly if you get the uncomfortable feeling that someone's trying to sell you something you don't need, you could avoid that person, but you have options. If you feel that way about me, you can go talk to Sean. You feel that way about John, you can come talk to me. All my point is, is find someone that knows what they're talking about <clears throat> and that you have a level of trust in, whether that's from a referral or otherwise, that um, they're going to give you some real helpful advice and a listening ear. Sometimes that's all you need. Um, realistic goals. I think caregivers expect way too much of themselves. And I understand that I made a vow to my wife, just like maybe you did to your spouse or, uh, or otherwise that you're gonna be with them in sickness and in health until death do you part. And that's fantastic. But getting some extra help as a caregiver doesn't mean you're not doing that. In fact, it can mean you're doing a better job of that than letting yourself burn out. So real, being realistic about what that vow might mean or what your goals are and what your limits are is important. Um, just a, a couple other ones here. Uh, accepting your feelings. A lot of folks are getting going to counselors. I think that's a great step. Somebody to talk to. Uh, learning. You're doing that right now, which is fantastic and a step that a lot of people aren't taking, but you're learning about the tools and the services that are out there. And the setting aside time for you. I've touched on that. You've got to value yourself as a caregiver. You've got to set aside time for yourself to make sure you're healthy and <clears throat> go forward from there. So with all that said, all of these bullet points are easier said than done. Uh, for me to sit here and say it to you is, is a real easy step, but they must be done if you're going to avoid the things that I mentioned at the beginning of this. Uh, and that's just a fact. There's enough research now that shows if you want to be healthy as a caregiver, you've got to take some of these steps and, um, and, and move in that direction. So, and that's what we want for you. That's what Benavia wants for you. That's what Sean and I want for you and all the families we work with is, is healthiness for the caregiver and the care recipient. So that's, that's caregiver burnout, a little bit on how to address it. Uh, Sean's going to talk about options related to, uh, to that and other things that can help you address it. Yes, yes, that's that's perfect and absolutely imperative. And I concur with everything that Presley just said. It's super duper important because where is that loved one gonna be if the caregiver does burn out? And where is that loved one gonna turn to if 
that caregiver isn't there to help them. So yes, super duper important. So now we want to paint the picture for you of what is out there? What are your choices? And Presley mentioned, and I would also concur with them on this, we've met with hundreds and hundreds of families and the only thing that each person has in common is that they have a unique and individualized need. And so we really want to hone in on that and figure out what is it that is the challenges within that family's dynamic and how could we potentially impact them? Oftentimes we're not the right fit. And I always lead with that. I say home care isn't for everybody. Um, and that's okay. If we're not the right fit, well then let's find the right fit for you. And so we're going to outline what the different choices are that you have out there. And then you have to make that very personal decision as to what do those next steps look like? Where do I want to get more research? Where do I want to get more understanding? Because I'm going to highlight each of these different options, but there's a lot more to them than what I'm going to talk about. And of course, Presley and I are happy to answer questions with regards to them as well. So we'll start with where Presley and I lie, which is in the home care space and we provide the non-medical in-home care. So I wanna distinguish between medical home care and non-medical home care. The medical home care oftentimes and almost always will be covered by Medicare or Medicaid. And that's typically when somebody goes to the hospital and then is discharged, a doctor is gonna write a note just like a prescription and they're gonna give you a certain number of visits that then you're gonna receive in your home to help make sure that that transition from the hospital back to your health house is a smooth transition. Because now with the rules with Medicare and Medicaid, they can't have somebody going back to the hospital for the same thing within 30 days. So it's super important for these hospitals to not have readmittance and people that are being bounced back for the same thing. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna have somebody come in on the home health piece and they're typically gonna be in there for anywhere from two to eight weeks. And they're gonna come in anywhere from two to four times a week for usually an hour. And some of the things that they're gonna help you with could be physical or occupational therapy. They can help you with medication management and making sure that your medi sets are set up correctly and that you're taking the prescriptions correctly. They can help you with the shower, making sure that you're getting in and out of the shower safely. Um, but they're going to come in for those quick visits, accomplish those few tasks that I just named. They're not going to come in and make a meal for you. They're not going to drive you to a doctor's appointment, um, those kind of things. They can help you with wound care, for example, and things like that, changing bandages, um, things along those lines. So that's going to be a medical home care professional that's going to be a nurse level person who's going to come in and help you um, for a short period of time in each day and a short period of time that the doctor prescribes. The, the opposite end of that is the home care piece for Presley and I like. And we can come into a home for just a few hours every day, or it could be a few hours every week. Whatever that client needs is where we fit into the equation. But we go all the way up to and including, we're with clients 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can never leave them. So when one caregiver comes on shift, the next caregiver would come into that home and make sure that that client's being safe. And it's all based on the level of cares that that client needs. And so some of those things that we can help out with is if the client needs help with dressing and bathing and grooming and toileting and personal hygiene, transportation, taking them to and from appointments, whether they're personal or doctor's appointments, um, medication reminders, we're gonna do all of those little things that that client may need assistance with. Now, in some cases, we're doing a lot with those clients. In some cases, we're not doing very much at all. It's more companionship. But again, we always meet the client where they're at. They may have had um, shoulder surgery or a knee replacement. And so we may be doing all the vacuuming in the home. We may be doing all the meal preparation in the home, but we're getting that person back up and running it on their feet so that they're feeling good. Or like Presley mentioned, it could be somebody with dementia who's having a lot of confusion and we may be doing all those tasks for the long run. So again, we always meet them where they're at and we help them with those activities of daily living um, that they may be challenged by or challenged with. Um, and then the other options that you have out there 
is potentially going to an independent living community. That's going to be where it's an apartment style home and you're going to be thriving and living independently on your own. Um, and there's not going to be services coming into that independent living community. And um, you're really on your own. But the nice part about it is oftentimes the independent living have an opportunity where you can go to assisted living, which I'll talk about in a moment. You can graduate up as you need those additional cares and steps. Other option is potentially if you did need a, some assistance is you could bring in an outside agency like Presley or myself and the home care piece, or oftentimes those independent livings will have staff that you can call upon, especially if there was an accident or something that needed immediate attention, and they can help you with that on a case-by-case -case basis. But reoccurring, needing, cell, needing help with things, um, on a consistent basis, they would want you to move on from that independent living to the assisted living. So it's a great option um, if you're looking to kind of start that process of going in to a senior living community, but it's that early entry spot where you're really able to thrive on your own. Then you move on to the assisted living piece where if you need some help, so for example, maybe um, it's become too much to do your own household chores. It's become too much to manage your own medication. <clears throat> You're needing some assistance throughout the day. That's where that assisted living is going to come in. And that's another senior living community option where they're going to come in and check on you typically once or twice a day and make sure that everything's okay. Um, and so that's another option that you have as well. And then beyond that, you have the continuing care retirement communities, CCRCs. And that kind of goes back to what I initially talked about where they're gonna have multiple steps in the care continuum under one umbrella. And so you could go into a senior living community that's a CCRC where you start off in the independent living and then you eventually graduate to the assisted living and then the skilled nursing and potentially the memory care piece. So, there's a lot of options and there's a lot of different senior living communities out there. They're all different. They all have various prices and income level requirements and different ways that you could potentially become a part of their communities. But for certain people, this works out really well. And I always give two examples when I talk about this. My grandma, as soon as my grandpa passed away, he was 65 and she was 63 at the time. She immediately sold her house, took all that equity, and then put that into moving into a CCRC, put a big down payment down on living in that CCRC for life. And then she went through every one of those steps that we just talked about. She was an independent living for eight years. Then she moved to assisted living for five years. Then she eventually moved into the skilled nursing. And then she eventually passed away, but she was there for nearly 20 years and went through each of those steps. For her, it was perfect. And she loved it. She was very social. She loved going on the buses, the activities, the bingo, all of it was great for her. The opposite side of the coin, and this is where Presley and I come in, is that 90% of seniors say, given all options on the table, they want to stay in their home. And they want to stay in their home until the very end. And so that's where home care comes into the equation is that 90% group. And that was what my grandparents on the other side of my family wanted to do. And so they became more and more elderly. They got into their 90s. They became more and more disabled physically. Mentally, they were as sharp as a tack, but they needed that help. They needed that in-home care piece to come in and help them with all those activities of daily living that just became too much for them as they moved into their 90s and they loved it and they thrived under it and it was perfect for them. And so that's really the equation of each family's individual needs need to be met and looked at and it's not always a cookie cutter. It may look like one option makes perfect sense, but as you dive more and more into it and you're doing more research, it may not make sense for you. So I encourage everybody that I speak with to do all the research on all the different options out there Find the one that you think is going to be the best for you and really start to dive into it and peel back those layers of the onion so that you truly understand exactly what you're getting into and what the pros and the cons are of it. Is one-on-one -on -one care more desirable for you or would you rather be in a community where there might be a ratio of 10 or 20 to one for each staff member? 
do you want to do you want to be involved in a community and put a big deposit down and be there for the rest of your life or do you want to be at a community where you don't want to put down a deposit do you want to have somebody come in for four hours a day once a week or are you looking for 24 7 care so the gamut out there is enormous and that's part of the challenge that i feel like presley and i are out in the community doing is just to educate people and say hey these are the different options. Here's all the things to consider. And as you're considering all those, we're here to help and educate. And we have referral sources and partners and friendships amongst all different aspects within the senior community. And so if you're leaning into us and you need help, we're all for that. But if you're leaning into us to say, hey, I don't know, but I'd like to learn, we're here for you. And we'll always be here for you to help educate you and your loved ones. But the biggest thing is we want to make sure that the home dynamic and what's happening between the caregiver and the person receiving the care is safe and happy and healthy and that everybody's thriving. So Sean, Adult Care Assistance Home Care, and thanks for listening. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Uh, we're open to questions. I don't even know how many people are on the, the call, but certainly I think we've got plenty of time for you to ask. Great, so you've got plenty of time to ask your question, make sure we get to a thorough answer. Sean and I'll tackle it together. And you can ask about anything, except COVID. Even Elvis Preston? Can't ask about COVID or how, how I got my name. <laughs> Person in the upper right yeah. talking to you. Yep. Mm. There we go. Marty, were you trying to ask a question? Can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Okay, uh, I switched to my phone. Um, how do finances play into the level of care? And what support does Medicare um, or supplemental health insurance play into this? Yeah. yeah, so that's a great question. It's one of the questions that we get most frequently. There's really two paths in terms of the financial piece. So you have Altex, which is an acronym, and it's the written out name is Arizona Long-Term Care System, Altex. And so if you qualify medically and you qualify financially, there is a program through the state where you can receive caregiving through the state at no cost to you. Now that does have to be signed off by a doctor. As you can guess, it's a state agency. There's a lot of paperwork, financial disclosures, things that you have to fill out. I always recommend to every single person that I speak to about Altex that they do consider using an elder law attorney because they're experts in the field. They'll help push that paperwork through and make sure that you're getting the services that you need in a timely manner because if you do miss something, you do get kicked back to the bottom of the pile and it takes a long time to get approved. So I never wanna leave somebody hanging with regards to all techs, but that is an option out there, but it's both medical and financial qualification. So I always emphasize that too, is uh, you have to get both. It's not a one or the other, it's both have to qualify. Uh, second piece would be also where we come into play. So we're a private duty caregiving agency. And so there's a couple different paths in which um, you are able to pay for this. First one is of course, out of pocket. And depending on the client and the hours that they need, the cares that they need, the long-term projection of what the client's gonna need, we're looking at all of that as we take on a new client. So we wanna make sure that they're very appropriate for us and that they have the means to take on having a home care agency come in. And then in terms of how they also could pay is through long-term care insurance, which the acronym is LTC. And just like life insurance, many companies back in the 40s and 50s and 60s provided long-term care insurance as a benefit. And then also there are a number of seniors who took out supplemental policies just on themselves independently. And you paid for it just like you would life insurance and there was a premium that's been paid. 
and they range just like life insurance all over the board. Some have $50,000 maximum benefits. Some have $5 million maximum benefits and everything in between. There's no two plans that seems like that are the same. We personally do take long-term care insurance. You have to document everything that you did in the home, the day, the time, the activities of daily living that you participated in. You have to submit that documentation to the long-term care insurance company, and then they reimburse the client directly. And so then you start receiving those checks as we're submitting those documentation. And so it's essentially a way for you can be reimbursed for it. Um, the other component to it is, and I'm not a tax lawyer, so don't take this as the gospel, but there is a way where you can submit documentation through your accountant or financial planner and let them know how much you've spent on home care, and you can receive a tax deduction on that. Again, everybody's financial situation is completely different, so I don't want to say it's a slam dunk, but I do know that our clients some of them have been able to write off the home care services. Um, so those are kind of the different paths. Our primary focus, about 80% of our clients are private duty, private pay. So they're paying out of pocket and about 20% are long-term care insurance. And then there are other home care agencies that do take that all text piece. So those are the three main buckets of how it could be paid. Yeah, and I'll just, I'm not sure, uh, I think it was Marty, on you know the cost for it's pretty much the same with senior living communities uh, there are going to be state funded senior living communities where medicaid will step in and help pay for the care of a person who's living in that community and then there are private pay senior living communities and the only thing i'll add to what sean said is you're going to have to do the shopping when the time comes Hopefully you do it before the time comes so that you already kind of have an idea, but Benavia is a great place to go to call and say, I'm looking into home care. Uh, do you have a few names that I can call and find out what their rates are, how they structure their costs, um, what their processes are so that you can find some, you know, find out who you trust and which way you want to go. And then same with the senior living communities. You want to call them, tour them, ask them how much their monthly rate is and what it includes because uh, you don't want to be stuck in a place where they're going to start upcharging you for a lot of things as you go forward, which can happen. So uh, you're really going to have to do a little bit of your own research on what the cost is going to be. Yeah. And I'll add one more thing, which I probably should have mentioned, which is to directly answer your question in a general sense home care agencies charge about 25 to $30 an hour. Everybody's a little bit different. How they structure it's a little bit different. Of course, how they do their payments, all those things. Um, we wanna leave a little wiggle room because we have great partners in the community and it's not necessarily about me or Presley today. It's about educating you on home care, but that's a general good starting rule of thumb is 25 to 30 an hour for home care. And that's gonna be that one-on-one -on -one care where that caregiver comes into the home and provides help to that senior. Do those home care people need to be certified education-wise, pass background checks? Uh, yes, by us and by Sean, they do. The state of Arizona does not require any of that for an individual to be a home care worker. So it's important for you and the community to know that if you're hiring someone privately on your own, or if you're working with a home care company like one of ours, each company has their own policies and procedures in place. And for us both, I know, and for anybody associated with Benavia, I believe, uh, that's going to include background checks, drug tests, certification, training and experience, and uh, as well as insurance, which includes general liability insurance in case something gets broken, and workers' compensation insurance in case the person gets broken, uh, so that you don't end up paying for that and you're not taking on the liability for that, which if you hire someone privately, you do take on those 
responsibilities. So uh, that might have been a little bit too formal of a response, but that's how it works. Yeah, I, the, I, I'm just thinking of some of the people that I work with. Um, can a family member be assigned through you folks to care for another family member? Yes, absolutely is the answer. Um, and that typically happens through the Altex program. So that is an absolute way where you can do that through the state. Again, medically approved through the state and financially approved through the state. And then yes, that loved one could be the paid caregiver through all tax for that person. Absolutely, yes. In terms of us on the private duty side, um, that wouldn't be the case. Um, that would be, a, if, if you were, if you needed care, it would be one of our employees that would come in and provide that care. It wouldn't make sense for us to pay a loved one and then charge you more, because of course we're charging more than we're paying for the caregiver. So that wouldn't make sense on that side of it. But on the all tech side of it, absolutely that is possible and does happen. Okay, because I can see where part of the burnout that's occurring is because somebody is not working uh, because they have to stay home and, and take care of mom. And so there's a dual financial stress Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I think for those families that are having challenges financially, I encourage everybody. And I can't tell you how many times Preston and I have met with the family and they've said, oh, I can't qualify for all techs. I own my home and I own my car and I have X, Y, Z coming in and they get approved. And I don't work on that side of it. That's where I strongly encourage the elder law attorney. And there's some amazing ones that Benavia works with. Um, but they can get approved. And so I, I never want to discount the possibility of somebody getting Altex because it can happen. And so, yes, absolutely. I think that's super important. But then to what Presley was talking about too is we, want, we don't want to overstate that, okay, you get Altex, you get medically and financially approved, and now that caregiver is being compensated financially for all that hard work. That's step one. That is wonderful and they deserve that and they've worked hard for that, but that's still not speaking to the respite piece. And so we wanna get back to that and say, okay, is there other family members? Is there other friends? Is there other neighbors? Is there other resources that we can pour into? Because ultimately we don't want that caregiver to burn out. Whether they're being paid or not, it doesn't mean that they're not gonna get burnt out. None of our caregivers in a week, 24 hours a day, seven days a week is 168 hours. Never in the history of the world has there been a caregiver that's worked 168 hours other than the caregiver who's caring for that loved one in the home. And the reason for that mm -hmm. is nobody can work 168 hours in a week. We would absolutely crush our entire staff. In fact, they can't work 80 hours in a week. We'll burn them out. And so that, that's just the impossible task that it is. And when you kind of spell it out in that way, the respite is incredibly important. So yes, even if you get approved for all techs, I still strongly encourage you to get those breaks. You need breaks. Well, I just know the case that I'm thinking of, the fact having some income come in would be a gigantic stress relief. Absolutely, yes. Um, so, okay, thank you. Those are great questions, Marty, thank you. Anybody else have some questions? And don't be afraid to share. I mean, we're, we're here to get uh, the answers for any issues you're dealing with right now. Trish, you have a question? You will have to unmute, Trish. Uh, I don't have a question so much as a comment. Um, my mom uh, is living in a facility, but I still am her her contact, I still do a lot for her. But we did apply for all tax. And what I just want people to also know that it is an arduous procedure to apply. But also there's annual recertification. There's, uh, and it's a lot of work. So just, I mean, sadly, once the approval is done, that it's not over. Um, I'm very grateful for the benefit financial support but 
There are guidelines, restrictions, and they even surprised me during Christmas and New Year's that I had to do paperwork, do the day after Christmas, um, kept, you know, caught me by surprise. So I don't want to discourage people from doing it because as in my mom's situation, it's an absolute necessity, but uh, it, it, it does require a responsible person to, um, to maintain the account, so to speak. Yeah, and I, I concur with all of that. It is not an easy process. It is a boatload of paperwork. Every single T has to be crossed. Every I has to be dotted. And we've had a number of people where they forgot that they inherited a piece of land in Wyoming 20 years ago from an uncle that they barely talked to. And lo and behold, it comes up on the all text report and they get their whole application rejected because they forgot about this piece of land in Wyoming that they got deeded to them 30 years ago and never even thought about. And so you have to start the whole process all over again. So yes, it is a ton of work. That's why I strongly recommend always going through an elder law attorney. And I can't emphasize that enough because they are the experts in this. They also can vet you a little bit and go through where you're at and say, yes, I think this is a likely approval or yes, I think this is an unlikely approval. And they can give you that feedback up front so that you're not spinning your wheels towards something that may or may not come to fruition. They also can give you a prognosis. I think you could get approved for X or I've experienced that somebody similar to you got Y. And so you can kind of build out what you're gonna be expecting on the back end too. So it is not easy. It is a full load of paperwork. It is a state government bureaucracy, but the glass is half full, and I tell everybody this, the glass is half full. People get approved for all techs every single day. Lots and lots and lots of people. It is real, it is out there, and they are helping the community. So don't be discouraged by it. Figure out a way, and if you need help and you need resources, reach out to Benavia, reach out to Presley, reach out to me, we'll help you. Thank you, because I, I have been the responsible party to um, get my mom initially approved. And this it's been ongoing recertification for, I guess we're going into the fourth year now. And it is a pain in the neck. But again, the benefit, she could not live without the benefit. So it's a necessary evil. And it does definitely add to the caregiver stress. There's no question about that. <laughs> Excellent. Anybody else have further questions? How are you responding to uh, COVID? Uh, as far as... Yeah, it was there. <laughs> as, as, as far as... Clear the COVID <laughs> questions were not... Uh, allowed as part of no I'm just kidding William um, so we're responding the best way we can and I'm sure Sean is as well uh, you know we're trying to manage uh, minimize the number of interactions that our caregivers have with a variety of clients we are using PPE uh, you know personal protective equipment and we are trying to offer alternative interactions to clients when uh, they prefer that. So we're meeting with people over Zoom, we're interviewing our caregivers over Zoom, we're doing online trainings. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter though, is that caregiving is a very personal, intimate experience and we're providing that experience in your home. And so we have had families that have backed away during this time because they have kind of decided that they want to stay isolated and only interact with family members. We have had other ones who don't have that option and have increased mm -hmm. the level of care that we provide. So, um, you know, we've got face shields, we've got masks, we've got gloves, we've got gowns. Uh, we, we, may, we require that our caregivers check in and sign every day that they're not experiencing symptoms before they go into anybody's home and, and provide the care. Uh, a lot of new policies and procedures. And uh, honestly, it's, it's been pretty manageable for us, to be honest. Uh, as far as the number of cases go, 
than uh, the transmissions from clients to our caregivers or otherwise, because often it's our caregivers that are concerned about going into the home or going into the community, right? It's not just our clients that are worried. So we have to manage it on both sides and, you know, knock on wood, we've been really, really happy with how it's gone uh, for us so far. I don't know if Sean has anything to add there. Yeah, I concur with everything that Presley said. I mean, we're in a whole new world here. And if you would have told me a year ago that this is the world that we're living in, I would have said, you're crazy. This is impossible. We've never been in the personal protective equipment business. And I feel like we've dived into that. <laughs> so and, and initially back in March, April, May, we, we were struggling to even get this stuff, you know, a surgical mask and gloves and gowns and face shields, you know, they were just flying off the shelf and we couldn't buy them at any price anywhere in the world. And now we've been able to build up a stockpile. We have a safe amount, a few months supply, so that if that, if that uh, supply chain line does break for some reason, we, we have a stockpile and we're able to provide those to the caregivers. But it's a two-way street. And I think Presley said it perfectly. We have some clients who wanna wear masks and gloves and they're sanitizing like crazy and they're worried about themselves and that's great and we'll help them in that process if that's what they would like but for us we require all the caregivers exactly the same as presley to be wearing those masks to be wearing the gloves to be sanitizing like crazy um but i always say there's no guarantee on this thing we can take every measure possible and it still might not be the perfect outcome but what i can say is we're going to control what we control and can control, and we're gonna do everything in our power to keep everybody as safe as we can. Um, we've had a few cases, no question about it, on the client and the caregiver side of COVID, but we've really tempered that down, and um, we've done an excellent job on that side, but you can't get rid of it. It's everywhere in the community, it's everywhere in the state, we're in a hot spot, and so we're doing everything we can to keep everybody safe, and quite frankly, at the beginning of this thing, we weren't even considered essential services by the state. We had to go back to the state legislator, lobby and petition to them to say, we are essential services. We do provide in-home care for these seniors who can't thrive on their own. And some of them couldn't make it on their own without our services. We got the state to reevaluate that and call us essential services. But we also know that we have to continue to provide that care in the homes, just like Presley was saying, some of our clients don't have an option. We are their only lifeline. And so we're always gonna be in those homes. We're always gonna protect them. And we also know by virtue of what we do, we're working with the most vulnerable group of people practically you could have. They're elderly, they have pre-existing conditions, they have respiratory issues. All the things that everybody's worried about from the COVID piece are our clients. It perfectly describes them. and so. We take it very, very, very seriously. And I can promise you that all the Benavia Care Partners take this very seriously. We're doing constant training on it. We're going over it over and over and over again. And we're also doing the same thing that Preston's doing, making them sign in every single day that they haven't been exposed to COVID, they're not showing symptoms, all of those different things. I'll Great. also say that we have a little bit of an advantage in that we're not managing an entire community. Uh, I mean, I, that sounds like an even bigger challenge. And as we've heard, right, there's been these challenges in communities. That, that's tough. Uh, we get the opportunity in home care to manage a particular home of one individual at a time and make sure that we're keeping that particular area safe. And we can really do a good job of then of managing interactions that way. And then the last thing I'll say on your question is that, uh, probably the biggest impact of this has been the staffing shortage that we've experienced, partly because of COVID, but mainly because of the uh, unemployment payments that have kept a lot of caregivers working, well, staying home and not working. So what we've been having to tell clients is you need to plan a little bit further out. Uh, call, you can't expect probably to get a caregiver the next day or in two days you're really going to be waiting a little bit longer because there is a real staffing shortage even greater than what we experienced before. So I will, yeah, I think Sean, I don't know if you'd add to that. It, yeah. It can vary, but it's, it's tight on finding caregivers. I'm probably in touch and I'm sure Presley's the same with a dozen different home care agencies. And these are some of the biggest 
most well staffed and respected here in Arizona. And I have not spoken to one who says that they don't have a waiting list for new clients. And so, yes, this is across the board, the entire state, everybody's in the same boat. And this is unique and new to us. We haven't been in this position before. Oftentimes we would get that fall call, you know, or the call of a discharge from the hospital. Hey, my loved one's being discharged from the hospital at seven o'clock tonight. Can you get a caregiver over there to the house by 7 p.m.? We'd like to have somebody there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Presley and I and the other home care companies staff those all the time. And it was not a challenge or an issue. Now, quite frankly, if we get those calls, we scramble, we try to find help, we'll, we'll find our resources, we'll call other home care agencies because we don't want to leave somebody on their own. But the reality is, is we're calling somebody else who's given the same answer, which is we're full, we're at capacity, we have a waiting list. And so I agree with Presley, we are a very much a need-based. Nobody wants home care. Nobody says, oh gosh, when I get elderly, I can't wait to have home care. It's gonna be so much fun. This is not a sports car that somebody thrives to have, but you need us. And when you call and you need us, we wanna be there to help. But yes, you can't emphasize enough that that last minute call, it may not go exactly as you're planning because these caregivers right now are in such high demand and everybody's looking for great caregivers but it's a really hard job. Just like we talked about with caregiver burnout with the loved ones, same thing on the, on the employee side. You know, There is that caregiver burnout. We wanna make sure that they're getting their time off and they're getting their rest and their time with their family. And so we don't wanna stretch them to 80, 90, 100 hours a week. And so we have to balance that with the client needs. And so that's probably been the number one challenge of COVID that we faced over the last two or three months, for sure. Uh, that's, a, that's a great answer, very informative. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Uh, those are some fantastic questions. Anybody else have uh, an issue they would like us to touch on? Don't forget you can raise your hand or use an icon. We're watching you. <laughs> Private eyes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, gentlemen, yeah. I want to thank you both for being here this afternoon. I'll come into the screen a little bit. I think. No. But um, once again, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, this is this is a you know, for lack of a better description, it's, it's, a, it's a very scary and trying time when you're a caregiver. Uh, if there's any solace, there's a, there's a huge percentage of folks that are living in Arizona that have been or are on the caregiver journey right now. Um, we see it with our senior population being so much higher. Um, but there are resources. I mean, I liken back to the day I'm here as well because I was on the caregiver journey back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, my parents have since passed away, but back then there was not one one hundredth of the resources available for folks to turn to, especially folks like Presley and Sean and the care, um, caregivers that uh, before you uh, basically put your loved ones in a quote unquote retirement home and they watch TV all day long. Um, there's some great resources out there. Do not be bashful to look for help for yourself. We, you know, we, I guess the, the takeaway is today is we're trying to prevent anybody from getting caregiver burnout. So if you need a phone call, uh, call Benavia. Um, these two gentlemen are just a great example of all the great resources we work with on a daily basis. And if you're looking for help or you're looking for an ear with your issues, please, uh, like I said, don't be bashful. Give us a shout. We will help you, you know, as much as we can. Um, just want to let you know that this was a lot of information today. Um, I will have this particular call that's being recorded. It will be up on our YouTube channel. I will also post it on our Facebook page, makes it easy for you to find. And if you gentlemen are okay, I'll have the presentation as well available to you. I will send that out to all our attendees via email, so be looking for that. And let's start a dialogue. It's open communication from here on out. So if you have more questions or such, and that email comes out to you, please feel free to call us. 
I'd like before we leave, if both you gentlemen would again go over your companies, your names, and your contact information so everybody has that. Sure. Uh, Presley Reader, and the name of the company is Comfort Care. That's Comfort Care without the T. Home Care, uh, phone number is 623 934 2722. Thanks a lot for letting us share a little bit today and uh, all the best in your journey. And I'm Sean, Adult Care Assistance Home Care. And you can find us at adultcareassistance.com on the web. And the phone number is 623-977-2223. And I concur with everything that Jay and Presley said. Thank you for taking the time and taking the time to educate yourself. And we're here for you. And if you didn't get that uh, written down fast enough, you can also look it up on our Benavia website which is benavia.com or benavia.org. They wind up in the same place. And look under our CARES program. These folks are our CARES partners. Or just give us a shout, and we will get that information directly to you. And if they have any other additional brochures or things you'd like to send to me, I will go ahead and forward them to you as well. So uh, you're armed out there in your journey, folks. So uh, we're doing our best to help you stay safe, stay healthy, uh, stay masked up, and stay away from uh, any of those folks that were uh, storming the Capitol building. <laughs> Especially the guy with Paul. Yeah, he's from Arizona. So thank you so much, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.